Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 2, and here's what it says. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So again, he's talking to the writer of Hebrews, which... Uh, nobody knows for sure. Some people think it's the Apostle Paul. Others think it's Barnabas or some other writer back in the day. It seems evident that this is pre-destruction uh, of Jerusalem before the temple was destroyed because it talks about uh, sac animal sacrifice and such that happened at the temple. But uh, the, the writer of Hebrews, as we will refer to him, is saying now to primarily Jewish believers or Hebrews, he's saying to them, hey, look, this new life that we have in Christ, in essence, is a better life. This is a better covenant. This is a better deal, if you will, that God has made with us than even he made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, etc. And so he says here, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Talking about to the gospel, to this new covenant. Verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So let's just stop right there. So he's saying, back to verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proved to be steadfast. Well, he's talking about that word of the Old Testament. Uh, of course, it wasn't called the Old Testament back in that day because they didn't yet have a New Testament or a new book of the Bible uh, called that we call the New Testament, which is made up, of course, of 27 different books. But he said, if, if the one that was from angels, that the angels of God uh, spoke and brought these messages to Abraham and to Moses and all of this, he said, if that proved steadfast, and it did, the Old Testament is accurate, it is the Word of God. In fact, it's the only scriptures that these New Testament apostles, uh, the apostles in Jerusalem, Peter, James, John, and the others, and Paul, and Barnabas, and Silas, and others, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament today, that's the Bible they had. That's when the Bible says they preached the Word, that's the Word they preached, because the New Testament was yet to be written. And so it says, if that word proved to be steadfast and every transgression and disobedient received a just reward, if, if there was judgment in how they responded to what we now call the Old Testament, then he says in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, what is he talking about? The new covenant, the new salvation through Jesus Christ. The Messiah has now come. He has died on the cross. He has paid for the sins of the world. He's been raised from the dead. And now we can be born again. And so he's saying, if they, before they could even be born again, before the Messiah had even come, before he had been raised from the dead, if they received a just reward and judgment, uh, according to how they were obedient to the Old Covenant, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I just love that phrase. Oh, this, this salvation that we have through Jesus is so great a salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? So Jesus is the one that first began to preach the new covenant gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it was confirmed by those who heard him. Well, talking about the 12 apostles, of course, uh, saved Judas and Matthias 
took Judas' place, but those 12 apostles who were with Jesus and heard directly from him, then they began to preach it. Verse 4, God also bearing witness. Notice this, what Jesus preached, what the apostles preached, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So here the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, how can we escape? Because uh, the Old Testament, you were those people were judged according to their obedience. But now the Son of God himself has come to preach this New Testament gospel. The apostles uh, corroborated it and continued preaching it. But God in heaven has corroborated with, has established it by pouring out signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit to confirm that this New Testament gospel of Jesus Christ is valid and true and indeed the word of God. So he's saying you can't get around it. God has already corroborated this and we better pay attention to it. And what is he doing? He's encouraging these Hebrews. He's encouraging these Jewish believers not to be disenfranchised with the, the Christian faith, if we could say it like that, uh, but with the New Testament uh, understanding that the Jews hadn't heard before, not to get disillusioned or to, to slack off or back off from it. It's like, oh, no. You need to pay attention to this. God sent his son to launch this gospel and has corroborated it. So pay attention to it because this is now what the Lord is saying to build upon the Old Testament. Not to, not to eradicate the Old Testament, but to build upon. In fact, the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. So uh, the Lord didn't come, Jesus didn't come to abolish the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. In fact, he said that. Okay, so it goes on to say now uh, in verse 5, For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. So the world to come, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, God didn't put that in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, talking about human beings, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus. So we don't see everything in creation put under human beings at this point. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Thank God he took it for us. Verse 10, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Don't you love that? He made him perfect through sufferings. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Don't you love this? He made us, I mean sinners, but through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he made us one with the captain of our salvation, who is the Lord of glory, who was raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of God, far above all principality and power, and God made us one. And it says, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. Don't you love that? Not slaves, not servants, brethren. Goes on to say, saying, saying, so he's going to quote from the Old Testament again, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. So this is a prophecy, but it's a prophecy that Jesus is saying, Way back before he was born in Bethlehem, he's saying this prophetically. I will declare your name, Father God, to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. I remember when Jesus was praying for his 12 apostles in John 17. He said, Father, uh, those who, whom you gave to me. 
And he was talking about his own 12. So it goes on to say in verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, oh, I just love this, talking of Jesus, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I just love this. Let me read it again. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. So talking about the children, I believe this is talking primarily focusing on the Jewish people. These are the children of God. Do you remember Jesus when the Syrophoenician woman came to him who was not Jewish and she had a demon, demonized daughter and she was begging the disciples and begging Jesus to deliver her daughter from this uh, demon. Well, Jesus said it's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the little dogs. The children were the Jews who had a covenant with God through Abraham. And Jesus says, not good to take the children's bread. He called healing and deliverance the children's bread. And so here it says, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, Jesus became a human being, flesh and blood, that through death, so that through death, he had to become a human being so that he could die in exchange for sinful human beings. He was a sinless human being dying for sinful human beings. So it says that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. Satan had the power of death before this, that he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's all the sinful uh, humanity. Verse 16, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Don't you love this? He does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. So notice again, it says Jesus is able at the end to aid those who are being tempted. But come back up now to verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. <laughs> who is the seed of Abraham? Well, of course, if you're Jewish, you're the seed of Abraham. Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so everybody from that point on in the line of Israel was covered in that covenant with Abraham. But Galatians 3, 13 and 14 say, uh, if you are Christ, it says, Oh, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ. And it goes on to say in the 29th verse, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Gentiles here are included. If they're in Jesus, Jesus is Jewish from the descendancy of Abraham. If you're in Jesus, then you now have inherited this blessing, the blessing of the covenant through Abraham, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so once again, Indeed, he does not give aid to angels. See, angels, you think they're much higher than you. But no, God doesn't give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. He's in covenant with the seed of Abraham, and that includes we Gentile believers. Verse 17, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Jesus had to be made like us, like a human being, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make a propitiation, a sacrifice for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. So like it's going to say in the fourth chapter, the 16th verse, Jesus was made a human being and he was put right in touch with what it feels like to be a human being, the temptation, everything. Thankfully, he never sins, so he could still be the replacement for us on the cross. However, he did feel the pressure, the temptation. He felt the weakness of the flesh. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, 
Uh, not my will, but yours be done. Father, if there, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. He was feeling, and of course, that's the cross. None of us have gone through anything like that before. However, he felt what it was like to be a human being, pressured and tempted to do his own thing. And thankfully, he didn't do it. But at least he is in touch with, and as we'll read, he sympathizes with our weaknesses. And so the Bible says that this gave him the ability to be a, a sympathetic and empathetic high priest who is in touch with our infirmities. Praise God. Well, as you can see, there's a case being built here, line upon line, precept upon precept. And uh, as we flow through this, you're going to see how this, this relationship with this Jewish man who died on the cross for us, is the Messiah, was raised from the dead. This relationship is going to bring into focus this whole Old Testament, the law, the sacrifices. It's going to bring it all into focus in one person, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as is said among the Jews, Yeshua. Yeshua. So this is an exciting book. It's building one chapter on the next. And so don't miss tomorrow because chapter three, I mean, is just loaded with prophetic revelation. So glad you're with us. Be with us every day. Invite somebody to read along with us.